Hi, my name is Sterling Brown, and it is a privilege to welcome you to today's GSSI Web Learning Moment. I want to welcome all of my athletic family out there around the country, our athletic trainers, our, our certified sports nutritionists, dietitians, strength and conditioning coaches. It is a joy to be together, and I want to dive right in. First, talking about the elephant in the room, right? Here we are, learning from home, having a webinar together. I'm coming to you uh, thanks to our sponsor, Great Gatorade Performance Partner, from my own home. I know wherever you are, maybe you're experiencing quarantine. So I thought, what better way than to start with some of my favorite quarantine memes? Let's check this out together. So number one, I don't know if you've been to Rome, the Sistine Chapel. The ceiling of the Sistine Chapel has a masterpiece by the artist Michelangelo. The Renaissance painter painted this and even God found some sanitizer at Walmart. I don't know how he found that, but, but there he is giving Adam a little bit of hand sanitizer. Love that one. Thanks to whoever put that one out. What about this one? Even Baby Yoda's getting in on the action when everyone is complaining about quarantine, but you're an introvert. This is kind of a shout out to my wife. She's definitely an introvert. Um, another one, the doctor had a report for the patient. Your COVID-19 test came back positive. Of course, the patient says, that can't be correct. I have more than 300 rolls of toilet paper. That is a classic. I don't know where you are, but uh, toilet paper is a little hard to come by here in the Atlanta area as well. And, uh, and certainly, this is uh, not the last by any stretch. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out to New Yorker magazine for this one. Um, maybe you discovered like this worker, my God, those meetings really could all have been emails, <laughs> right? So much, so much that we could take away from this experience together. I know it's very challenging times. If you have a, a loved one or someone that you know who has, uh, has come down with this virus or struggling with it, our thoughts and prayers obviously are going out to you or encouraging our first responders. We're lifting them up, but, uh, but this is a moment where we can dive in together. We, I want to invite you to, to go on a journey together with me. We're going to be looking at some of the challenges related to leading this generation of students. Again, you might find yourself at the high school or the college level or even with working with professional athletes. I don't know what context you find yourself working, but uh, anywhere I go around the country and I get with coaches and leaders and support staff and those uh, privileged to serve the next generation, I get a very, very common theme. Uh, one, of the, one of the big questions I ask is, is, have you ever thought to yourself, man, kids are different? Right? And, and it never fails when I ask that question, I get a lot of nodding heads and we have some great dialogue. Well, we've all kind of felt that. And, uh, and so what we wanna do is, is go on this journey together. And, and looking at this generation of student, I would say this, that those born after 1990, they've been called many names. They've been called the me generation. They've been called screenagers. Generation IY, that great book by our founder and president, uh, Dr. Tim Elmore. And, uh, and now, now, this current generation of student that's, that's going through K-12 and coming into the collegiate ranks, they've been called Generation Z. And, uh, and here's the fact, though they may ignore you, you cannot ignore them because they are a part of the biggest generation yet. The biggest generation. And yet, they are entirely different entirely different. And who we are, we are growing leaders and we've been working for 15 years uh, plus with, with really next generation leadership. So that's helping come alongside students uh, with leadership development, with um, you know really principles and images to help, help foster and instill some leadership, uh, timeless leadership principles in them. Because you know if you look around at the business sector and the corporate world, you look in the athletic arena and education, Oftentimes we see leaders getting trained for to be better leaders. And, and yet sometimes we see the students languishing a little bit. Well, we believe in the, this generation. We believe in the potential for leadership, for solving problems and serving people in this generation. So what we want to do is come alongside those young people and say, hey, you can do it. And we also want to come alongside you as leaders in their lives to say, hey, how can we get some better tools in our tool belt to connect with them? So that's what we've been doing literally around the world. And when you think about this generation, there's a couple of things uh, just right out of the gates that we want to want to kick around. Number one, I think we see that they're ambitious 
and full of ideas, yet often they don't finish what they start. And, and if they seem overexposed to information, well, it's because they are. They, there's a, a, a ubiquity of access to information like never before in history. And while they may be overexposed to information, they are underexposed to real life experiences. And, and I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes they can be overprotected, right? Parents involved a little too much in the, the success of their student. Now, I'm not saying that we just throw them out there to the wind. Their success doesn't just depend on them. They need us, and we're gonna talk about that here in a little bit. But they might be overprotected, and they might seem overwhelmed, and, and if they seem overly bored, well, we've gotta be willing to look in the mirror and acknowledge that maybe that's because we've raised them that way, and it's the adults in the room who have been contributing to whatever challenges that we might be seeing in our young people. So I wanna invite you on this journey. We're gonna go in this together, and, uh, and we're gonna have fun with this. So Growing Leaders, we've been working around the world with thousands of companies, sports organizations, uh, Chick-fil-A's and Cox Communications of the world and, and uh, school systems and collegiate programs all over the world helping to develop leaders. We've had the privilege of working with over 500,000 young people to teach leadership. And, uh, and we partnered with about 10,000 different organizations. This is a small sampling of just some of our athletic partners. Uh, and you'll see there, we're partnering with uh, professional sports teams and athletic conferences. But uh, that's just some of who we've been able to, uh, to reach and to touch and really to serve. And, uh, and when you think about what we do and why we do it, uh, I wanna just let you know this right out of the gates. I'm not here to tell my athletic trainers in the room how to tape an ankle or diagnose a shoulder any better or our strength coaches how to do like a power clean or develop a cardiovascular training program or anything like that. Uh, we are here to do two main things today. It's, it's to connect better with our, those students that we're serving and really to, to get equipped to train them better for leadership, to help them think about their influence and help them think and act like authentic leaders. So that's really what we're trying to do. My name is Sterling Brown, and um, and I work full-time at the, at the uh, great university, Kennesaw State, here in the Atlanta area. And uh, we're a suburb of Atlanta here in Georgia, and we've got about 33,000 students. We compete at the Division One level, and I've been here 10 years serving as the Director of Character Development here at KSU. And um, But that's what I do professionally, but but when I think about you, I think about me, even think about our students, uh, what, what I believe is that who you are is more significant than what you do. Obviously, you can do some things. You wouldn't be in the room if you have not uh, had a measure of success and, and, and have some real skills to be able to lead students and to be able to serve them with your skills. But, uh, but how many of you know we're, we're more than just our talent, our job, or our opportunity? And so when I think about who I am, I'm a husband and a father, I'm a son and a brother, and I want to just take a moment introduce my wife. That's her at the bottom right of 22 years. That's Missy Brown. And our four kids, our oldest is there in the middle with the hat and the glasses. She's 20. We have a senior. Um, uh, and then uh, our son is, is in... Uh, 10th grade. He's in 10th grade. That's right. And we have a middle school daughter. So uh, that's that's the whole crew. And, and the reason, one of the reasons I want to introduce them to you is is to let you know that that the conversations that, that I have with our student athletes that we have around the country with coaches and leaders is not, they're not just conversations that's good for us at the professional level, right? These are conversations that we have around our dinner table at the Browns, and we've seen uh, some effective tools to be able to connect with uh, our students even at home. So that's a little bit about me at the home front, and, and professionally, I've been um, really privileged to serve student athletes in leadership for about 25 years. So. I played football and baseball at the University of Richmond and started my career in collegiate athletics at Florida State as a strength and conditioning coach. So shout out to all my strength coaches out there. Uh, I was at Florida State for five years, moved up here to Atlanta and started working with college and professional athletes doing leadership development and mentoring. And so, I, as I said before, I've been at KSU now for 10 years, but I also um, get to travel the country and serve other leaders around the country. And, and this is just a, a small sample of the last two 
years of some of my own travels. Uh, not that it really is that interesting to you, but one highlight certainly has been uh, uh, getting to, to be with some of the leaders uh, around the country. Obviously, that's Coach, Coach Pete out there, University of Washington. Uh, it was great to be with him among the many others that have been privileged to serve. So my topic today is helping the next generation win, understanding and connecting with the most anxious generation. And I firmly believe that if you go to the doctor's office, you're not gonna walk in and they just instantly start throwing medication at you. No, the first thing that they would do is take some time to diagnose what's going on. How are you feeling? Do you have a temperature? Right? They're going to listen to your lungs. They're going to check your pulse ox, all those things in an effort to diagnose before they actually prescribe. So that's why we believe that it's important that we lead them, uh, excuse me, that before we lead them, we read them. We take some time, even in our conversation today, to let's let's look at this generation and let's read them a little bit. Let's look at the context and what's, what's going on in the world around them uh, before we jump right into trying to equip ourselves to lead them more effectively. So the first thing that I would say about this generation is that they're a generation of firsts. Think about that, a generation almost of pioneers. You know, my parents couldn't really help me uh, parent in the age of the smartphone, right? That the internet was barely even a thing when, I, when we started having children. And so that is a new dynamic, right? For us as parents, but think about the generation, the world that, that this generation of student is growing up in. I wanna break down a couple of these for you. They're the first generation that doesn't need adults to get information. Just that alone, you let that settle in. It used to be the adults in the room were the grand brokers of all knowledge, right? If they had a question, if a student had a question, it was raise your hand in class, ask Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, and, uh, or they would go to the coach. And of course the expectation with athletes and coaches was the coach says jump, the dietitian, the strength coach says jump. The, the, it's how high, right? Well, nowadays, they don't need that. They don't need adults to get information because they have access to all the world's information with the click of a key, click of a mouse, the swipe of a phone, right? The swipe of the thumb. They have access to all the world's information. Having said that, I'm not saying that the don't need adults, that they don't somehow need you. No, I believe they, they desperately need your wisdom and input. If not for information, they need you for interpretation. How do they make sense of all the information that's coming to them at, at faster and faster speeds? The second thing about this generation, it's the first generation that can broadcast their every thought or emotion. Right? They don't need a TV deal or a book contract. They know, right? Because they are so used to uploading content, uploading information. They are very aware of their influence that they can broadcast their every thought or emotion. They can let all their all the world know what they ate for breakfast or how they're feeling today, right? And and that is a new dynamic and it helps students be, be very dialed into the fact that there's a bigger world out there and they have a voice. That is a good thing. That is a good thing. The second, the third thing is this is the first generation that enjoys external stimuli at their fingertips 24 seven. This is research out of Virginia Tech and others that, that really have, have broken down that students are on their devices up to eight hours a day. They have access to external stimuli up to, for 24 hours nonstop. And so this is the first generation. You know, it used to be way back in the day, the sun would go down and you kind of just start settling down. Well, now our brains are just constantly on, right? Pings, alerts, uh, uh, tweets, and, and, uh, and, and notices. So all that to say, right? They, just that alone, this is the first generation that enjoys this. The fourth thing, this is the fourth generation, uh, this is the first generation that is in social contact at all times, yet often in isolation. Now this to me is kind of the quandary, right? Because, because students are di very dialed into, uh, as I said, their influence, they are aware, they've got a growing network of friends, hopefully, and people that they're in social contact with. A and yet, rather than having face-to-face -face human connection, more often than not, students may come home from whatever it is that they're doing 
and go in their room, shut the door, lock themselves away from whatever people might be in the room, the house or whatever, and, and, and connect to the world and their friends in an isolated way. And uh, some great research uh, from San Diego State is, uh, and, and other places have been outlining how this is actually having uh, very detrimental and devastating effects on on our young people, right? Levels of anxiety are increasing, levels of depression, uh, obviously suicidal ideation, other things. And there's a direct correlation between time spent with people, time in isolation, and time in uh, and on social media uh, with some of those things. And so we've gotta really be able to look at this. Uh, the fifth thing is that this is the first generation that adults have actually enabled to be narcissistic. We're gonna unpack this a little bit more here in a little bit, but you think about the adults in the room that have helped to create this environment where there's this inordinate obsession with self. How do I look? How, what do other people think of me? How am I presenting myself to the world? Now, some of that's good and that's important to think about, but, but at times it can get out of hand. But this is the first generation that it's the adults that have enabled this. And, and you think about this last one, uh, it goes back to some of what I just mentioned, but this is the first generation that endures the same levels of anxiety as a psychiatric patient in the 50s and 60s, right? This is research out of the CDC where they said one in five teenagers is going to have uh, a, an anxiety attack or some kind of mental disorder right, that in the 50s and 60s, young people that are going with, uh, dealing with some of the anxiety that, that our young people are dealing with today would have been admitted and medicated. And this is the first generation where we're seeing this, this elevation of anxiety and depression. All right, so those are a couple of things, challenges really facing them. And I wanna unpack that a little bit deeper because this is what some of the other research is telling us about Generation Z. Number one, they would describe themselves as overwhelmed. 94%, right, uh, say they, they're overwhelmed. And, and this was before the realities of coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, 44% say it's almost impossible to function, right? There's this sense of, man, there's just too much going on. Some of that is directly related to the access of information. You know, you just think about how when, when in real time, I can be getting reports of what's going on in the world, right? That can be in and of itself overwhelming. The second, the second thing about this generation that we're learning is that it's a selfie-absorbed generation. Selfie-absorbed generation. Now, again, I'm thankful for the iPhone and technology and the developments that come along with it, but we're seeing narcissism at an all-time high. It's Dr. Gene Twenge that has been tracking this. A longitudinal study has been looking at narcissism. And what she's telling us is that is that narcissism continues to increase, right? There's this obsession with me, myself, what do other people think of me. And, and the other side of that is also very concerning because what we're seeing is that there is a decrease in emotional intelligence and soft skills. Empathy is at an all-time low, right? Research out of the University of Michigan tells us that students today are, are about almost 50% uh, less empathetic than they were just a decade ago. So what am I saying with just those two facts? I'm saying that narcissism is increasing, and I'm seeing that empathy and emotional intelligence is decreasing. That is a serious gap, right? We know that students are, are maybe biologically advanced. They're technologically ahead, but they're socially and emotionally lagging behind a little bit, All right? So that's just some things we have to look at as we unpack some of this. And it goes back to really the world that we live in. I'm not just putting all of this at the feet of students, and, and I'm certainly not trying to paint some doom and gloom picture right here out of the gate, but I do want to take a moment and look at the world we live in because it impacts our perspective. We know that the world is so quickly changing, but it's slowly changing us. And so I want to look at that, and we want to do it by looking at our scene today. Our scene today. So this is a, this is a chart that Dr. Elmore uh, broke down in his, in his latest book. 
And, uh, and I want to give this to you today. So in looking at the world around us, uh, there's some things we'll see on the left that describe uh, our world. Our world that, that we have, have come to uh, adjust to, but for students growing up in this world, you've got to remember, it's native to them. This is all just the way that the world is. And, and if that's the case, I grow up in a world that's full of some things. It's easy, uh, conversely, to, to make some assumptions. And so we want to look at that together real quickly. So number one, I would say uh, our world is full of speed. Would you not agree with that? Our world is full of speed and it just seems to be going faster and faster, right? Kids today don't know the sweet sound of the dial-up modem. They don't know what it's like to, to have to just wait for a page to load too much because we just have so much uh, fast access to everything. Google, microwave popcorn, right? We can get so much so quickly. And in that kind of environment, it's easy to assume what? That slow is bad. It's easy to assume that slow is bad. Why should I wait for something that I can get instantly? And so, uh, would you not agree with me that our world is a world full of convenience? And of course, like many of you, I love the convenience of modern life. The fact that we could even have a webinar like this today or because we are quarantining or self uh, or staying at home, we can in many places order our groceries online or go and pick up something. They'll bring it to your car. That is, that is incredibly convenient. But in a world of convenience, it's also very easy to assume that that hard is bad. And this is actually the number one phrase that K-12 educators tell us at Growing Leaders when we work with them around the country. What, what they hear from students and they report to us, the number one phrase is, this is too hard. So work that's traditionally been done uh, by students, the expectations, uh, students are telling them it's just too high, the expectations are too high, this work is too hard. In a world uh, of convenience, it's really easy to assume that. The third thing I would say is that our world is a world full of entertainment. Would you not agree with me? I mean, we have we can stream whole seasons of TV shows now, and we can do it from device to device. Start in the living room, go on to someone else's house, pick it up on our phone, on the couch, take it with you to the office. It is nonstop entertainment available to us. And in a world that's full of entertainment, it's easy to assume that boring is bad. Right, so forget Malcolm Gladwell talking about 10,000 hours of mastery of something. That's, that's slow, that's too hard, it's boring. Sports Center's not gonna be out there watching me and filming me when I'm just running around the track, right? It's boring. And so we've gotta be able to acknowledge, you know what, some of that's not just the student. Um, would you not agree with me that our world is a world that's full of nurture? Nurture, it's almost like uh, little Timmy or Susie that had just been nurtured from day one, right? Born with a helmet and they're sitting at the dinner table with a bicycle helmet just to make sure they don't hurt themselves. And nowadays we're seeing more and more parents overly proactively involved in the lives of their students. Now, again, I'm not saying just abandon them or throw them out to the wind, but research is telling us that parents can be a little bit too aggressive, right? Forget helicopter parenting. Now we actually have like the snowplow parent, the, the parents just getting every obstacle out of the way of the student. And that becomes very challenging because the student then isn't wrestling with their own challenges, right? When somebody's gonna swoop in to rescue them or, hey, I forgot my, my uh, gym clothes. Can you come bring it to me at school? Uh, well, in a world full of nurture, it's real easy to assume that risk is bad. Why should I take a risk? Now, research is telling us that this is, this is a generation that, that aspires to be entrepreneurial, right? Uh, Want to take a risk and maybe start a business. But here's the thing. It also tells us that uh, this is the most risk-averse generation in history, right? Rather than, than, than going into uncharted territory and taking on new tasks and new challenges, this is a generation that's more and more risk averse. I don't know, am I gonna be an expert at that? Am I gonna be amazing at that? And if, and if you as a leader can't guarantee that, then, then your students are gonna be a little bit more hesitant to take on some new challenge because it just might seem a little risky, right? And they haven't as much had to deal with some of the same things 
uh, and take some of the same risks that you have had to. This is a world, lastly, full of the big E, right? And when I say the big E, I think you probably know what I mean. I get a lot of nodding heads when, I, when we talk about this uh, with coaches and leaders, uh, and it's a world full of entitlement. HR executives tell us this is the number one word that they use to describe students, graduates, and potential employees that they're, that they're looking at. They say, man, these, these young people are just so entitled. There's this sense of entitlement, like I'm going to actually have your job in six months, and if I don't, then I'm out of here. But in a world that's full of entitlement where I should have the house and the car and, and I expect to get all of the things that maybe the generation before me worked to get in that kind of environment, you know what it's easy to assume? It's easy to assume that labor is bad. Why should I work extra hard, go out of my way, show up early, stay late when it should just be handed to me? More and more young people, especially athletes, can really struggle with this. I've had coaches talk to me and say, Sterling, uh, I had a kid, um, a freshman on my team, was leading the team in minutes uh, on a basketball team, leading the team in minutes, complaining that they weren't getting enough playing time. I've had student athletes complain to me that they weren't playing, they were on the team, they had a vital role, but they weren't playing as much as they wanted to and I had to tell them, uh, you know, the truth. It's because this person's better than you. And in an environment where there's so much entitlement, of course, we don't have time to unpack the, the participation trophies, but, uh, but in a world that's full of entitlement, it's easy to assume, I don't know that uh, I, I wanna work that hard for that, right? Eventually it's gonna be given to me anyway. And I wanna tell you a quick story about, about a, a eighth grade teacher, her name's Diane Torado, and she's a social studies teacher, and uh, she actually, because of the big E, she had an unbelievable experience. She lost her job due to what she described as her school's no zero policy, right? And so on her way out, she got on her whiteboard and she wrote a little note to her students. And this is the note that she wrote to her students. She said, bye kids, Mrs. Torado loves you and wishes you the best in life. I've been fired for refusing to give you a 50% for not handing anything in. Love, Miss Torado. So all that to just highlight, there is this sense of entitlement that's out there in the world that kids have uh, been growing up with. And that's a challenge for us in leadership. Uh, one thing I did wanna just unpack for you, it, just speaking specifically about entitlement, it, is it helps to, to remember that there is a, an inverse relationship between entitlement and resilience. So the more a student feels entitled, the more we feel entitled to something, the less passion and perseverance we, we demonstrate, the less sense of, man, I can stick with it no matter what. There's also an inverse relationship between entitlement and gratitude. Well, if something's gonna just be given to me or handed to me, well, why should I be thankful for it or take care of it or feel a sense of responsibility for something. There's an inverse relationship between entitlement. When that goes up, gratitude goes down. And then lastly, look at this. There's also an inverse relationship between entitlement and happiness. Because oftentimes, when we have moments in our lives where we overcome challenges, where we demonstrate resilience, or we, uh, we can take a moment and pause and say, gosh, I'm, I'm really thankful for whatever it is that's in my life. That actually helps our sense of joy and our overall sense of happiness. That's actually gonna influence how I go about my work. It's gonna influence, am I gonna put in the extra time and effort and energy? Am I going to uh, appreciate my relationships and those in my life? There is an inverse relationship between entitlement and all of these things. So if you want to live your best life, right? Think about being resilient. Think about demonstrating gratitude and, 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 not, and not walking and living with a sense of entitlement. And how can we actually help our students to actually do that thing? That's what we're, that's what we're gonna be looking at. So the question is, well, in light of all of that, now what? You see there on the phone, how do we lead these students today? So let's talk solutions. Now, how do we lead them? I would say first and foremost, 
we got to have a little bit of optimism. I'm, as I said before, I'm not here painting some doom and gloom picture. I think we have to be a little bit optimistic. And when I think of optimism, I, I'm reminded of that classic scene in the movie Dumb and Dumber where, where uh, Jim Carrey playing Lloyd Christmas finally talks to Mary about his feelings for her. And, you know, he says, I like you, Mary. What are the chances of a, of a guy like you and a girl like me ending up together? And she said, your chances aren't good at all. And, uh, and he said, you mean like a, like a hundred to one? And, and of course she said, uh, maybe more like a million to one. And then, of course, the mo one of the most famous or quoted movie scenes ever, he says, uh, so you're saying there's a chance, right? So that's absolutely what I'm saying. I'm telling you there's a chance, and, uh, and, and we want to look at how can we give ourselves the best chance to lead these students, right? Um, I want to unpack habitudes later, but, but I want to let you know now, habitudes are images that form leadership habits and attitudes. They came uh, as a result of Dr. Elmore sitting with his younger kids at, at that point before growing leaders was even a thing and having leadership conversations with his, his student children talking about images. And so one image that represents a timeless principle that I want to share with you is this. It's bottled water. Think for a moment about the bottled water that we get to experience here in the West, right? And some other places around the world, they don't have the same convenient access that we do. But when you think about this, uh, water has, uh, has always been needed for life. And there's never going to come a time where people don't need water to survive, where really life doesn't need water to survive. But what's changed over time, you know, maybe back in the day they were going down to, to the, the river or the stream to get some fresh water in a, in a jar or something, or go and dig a well. Nowadays, again, here in the West, we enjoy bottled water at the local convenience store. What's changed over time is the way that water gets delivered. What's not changing is our need for water, right? And that is really a, a metaphor for leadership. In fact, when you think about bottled water, what's interesting to me is that I realized um, that bottled water actually has an expiration date on it. Like there's a date that's printed on the water that I purchased from the grocery store. And I went, oh my gosh, there's a there's an expiration date on here. Didn't realize that until recently. And, and what I discovered is that the date is actually for the bottle, not the water. Now, why that's significant is you think about these two ideas. There's never going to come a time that we don't need water. But what's changed over time is the delivery of that water. And that over time, the even the vehicle of delivery could expire. So what am I trying to say? I'm actually trying to say that great communicators use what's timely or changeable to say what is timeless and unchanging. So that's really what we're doing here. We're talking about some unchanging, timeless principles and looking at what are some ways that we can adjust What's changed over time in terms of the delivery? A great example would be what I mentioned earlier, where it used to be coaches said jump, and the athlete was to say how high. Well, nowadays, the coach says jump, and the athlete says, what do you mean jump? Uh, I watched five YouTube videos. None of them said jump. We've got to adjust how we deliver some of that information that we know is important. And so that's what we want to look at here. So we have to understand two things, the what and the how. And when I say that, I mean this, what is it that's like the water? What is it that students need? And then how do we deliver that in a way that makes sense to them? That's like the bottle, right? So when we talk about the what, there are four things I want to share with you quickly that students need. Number one is emotional intelligence. An increased emotional and social capacity. What is emotional intelligence? It's simply uh, self-awareness self-management, relationship awareness, right? That kind of relationship management. Uh, when you think about this, um, empathy is at an all-time low. I said that.
But it was uh, careerbuilder.com. They, they published a study that said 73% of employers would rather hire someone who is really high in EQ. That's emotional intelligence. They can get along well with others. They can communicate. They can pay attention, listen, carry on a conversation, and even disagree agreeably. What am I saying? That they can do teamwork. They'd rather hire someone who can do team that's high in EQ than someone who can just knock out the hard skills, they're high in IQ and they can get it done, but they can't get along well with others. That is something that we can really help equip our students with if we can, we can elevate emotional intelligence and really be intentional to equip them in that arena. Number two is a strength discovery, an identification of their personal value to others and an enhanced self-esteem rather than comparing, which is a trap or looking, being caught up in, in our social connections or social media and going, well, I'm not where so-and-so is. How can we help our students unpack their own personal strengths and look at what uniqueness they bring to the table, what inherent genius they have that's contributing to the benefit of others. If we can help them in any small way, then we're going to be uh, better for it and they're going to be better for it. Number three, moral intelligence. An ability to make better decisions in all spheres of life. You know, uh, students, all of us are just being bombarded with thousands of images all throughout the day. Every single day, it is a nonstop river of information. And with that information, you have all different kinds of value systems and philosophies and ideas of what's right and what's not right. And if we can just begin to help our students think about right and wrong, not because we are imposing that on them, but help them think through uh, maybe decision making and looking at consequences and uh, cost analysis, that sort of a thing. Uh, but we can help them make better decisions. It was research published by Notre Dame that said three out of four college university students said they had admitted to in some way cheating or cutting corners to get through college. 75% of students said, yeah, we, we did some things a little bit, uh, uh, you know, below the standard, if you know what I mean. Now that's, that's kind of shocking, but how can we help our students make better decisions? And number four, a leadership perspective, help them gain clarity on their personal influence and their responsibility in their life, right? It's sociologists who tell us that even the most introverted of person, right? Even the baby Yodas, if you remember that meme I started with, even the biggest introverts will influence over 10,000 people in their lifetime. And if we can help encourage our students and remind them that they have influence, that others are watching them and that everywhere we go, we're teaching people how to treat us and how to treat others. And they're taking cues, uh, taking social cues off our behavior and attitude. We can encourage them in their leadership and they can find ways to be intentional leaders, to think and act. Uh, as a thermostat versus a thermometer. That's a whole nother habitude we don't have time to get into. Those are four things that we call the water. What are some of the timeless things that students need to succeed in life? But how do we deliver that to them? That's the question, the bottle, so to speak. What is that water bottle, or that, that changing delivery method? So I wanna, uh, I wanna take a moment and, and just tell this to you, that this is an epic generation. This is an epic generation. When you think about the how, I wanna challenge you to think about your own leadership in an epic fashion. I'm not talking about you know, these uh, great stories like Homer's Odyssey or The Lord of the Rings, some epic uh, movie or book. Uh, it's an acronym that describes four aspects of this generation. Number one, the E in epic reminds us that they are experiential, that students would rather learn from uh, not the sage on the stage with great information, but a guide who can come alongside them and, and help them unpack experiences to bring experiences or help them interpret the experiences of their life. And wherever you find yourself, if you're a coach and you have an opportunity to, to drive that, right? Maybe I wanna remind you of Coach Herman Boone. If you saw the movie, Remember the Titans, right? Alexandria, Virginia, he had taken over, uh, an African-American coach had taken over leading this high school football team just after integration in the South, right? Alexandria, Virginia. 
And uh, it's a phenomenal story. It's a true story. And, and in the midst of all of the hostility that went along with trying to build a racially integrated team, Coach Boone loaded that team up, took them on a bus, and they went to Gettysburg. They went to Gettysburg and walked around and saw the, the gravestones of the people who lost their lives for this idea that's America. What Coach Boone was doing then, he was being epic. He was an epic leader providing an experience rather than just sit, preach at them and try to hammer this idea, you've got to be a team, you've got to be a team. He said, maybe we can be more effective if we can provide an experience that will help unpack and help us connect at an emotional level. So maybe you're a coach and you can bring your student athletes to a place or provide something. You can be epic and provide an experience by uh, having a game or some type of interaction, a way that they can feel, touch, participate, get, get sweaty, get moving, whatever that may be. Or maybe for you, uh, I don't know, maybe you're a, a trainer. You're going, gosh, an athletic trainer. I, I can't, I'm not going to bring all my student athletes out of the training room to do some experience. Maybe for you, you can take a few moments in, in a one-on-one -on -one fashion and share uh, a story from your own life an anecdotal experience where you can just connect at a heart level versus just being the professional all the time that knows everything just by sharing your own heart and telling your own experience that actually can help help paint a picture for that student. So just trying to think of ways where we can be experiential. Uh, secondly, the P in Epic reminds me that they're participatory. They're participatory. They would rather learn by participating. Many of you watching this, uh, you remember that Kelly Clarkson was the first person to beat out Justin Guarini for the finals of American Idol, right? She was the first champion of American Idol. And why I bring that up is because you also remember that that was the first show that invited the audience to participate. We got to call in and vote who stays on the show. Well, nowadays, that's normal. We're tweeting in, we're writing in, we're emailing, we're calling. We're, uh, students are, uh, are, are well aware that they have a voice to participate and they should have a voice. But oftentimes when they get in a professional setting with us and I'm the coach or I'm the trainer and I've got limited time with them, we just kind of have to give them our input. But, but oftentimes they get in that setting and they don't have as much opportunity to participate. So what if... What if we could increase student engagement by inviting their participation in something? If it's something as simple as creating a nutrition plan, helping them weigh in on that. Well, what are some things you would like to do? What are your goals? How would you like to see that happen? What days can you commit to, right? If we invite participation, we'll actually see engagement increase because students own what they help create. So I would challenge you to be participatory uh, in your leadership. The third thing, the I in Epic reminds me that they are image rich. They have learned the power of a picture. Of course, you know a picture is worth what? A thousand words, right? We've heard that since we were toddlers. And they know and how effective it is to communicate using pictures. That's why you probably have an Instagram account, right? And why they're not sending emails or checking Facebook lately is because they have just learned the art of communicating using images. It's the oldest uh, uh, form of communication, and we'll get to that later, but they're image rich. So if I have something to share, can I connect it to a, a powerful image that can kind of anchor that principle we're trying to convey by using a powerful picture to help cement that? I remember I was with a, with a group of coaches in uh, Michigan, and I had shared this, this idea with them a year ago, and I was back with them last summer, and the defensive coordinator said, Sterling, uh, man, I loved your presentation. You, you were talking about epic leadership. We went back with our staff and looked at what behaviors do we want our student athletes modeling, right? What do we want our defense emulating? And they came up with a list of a few behaviors and then invited the students to participate in coming up with the images that represented those principles, right? You see where I'm going with this. And so, and so those students, one example was uh, uh, their defense wanted to pride themselves on relentless pursuit. 
And they said, well, what's something that represents that? And the students came up with this idea of a lion chasing uh, zebras, right? Going for their meal with this relentless pursuit in the jungles of Africa. And so that was the image. And there was several others, but they said, uh, the coaches told me, they said, they said, Sterling, we haven't seen engagement like this ever in our time here at this school. And so it's just a small way that they invited participation, used the power of an image to bring more epic leadership uh, to their conversation. And then lastly, lastly, the C in epic reminds me that they are connected. The most connected generation in history by far. Yes, they're connected virtually, but they're also looking for human connection. And if we provide opportunity, hey, let's talk about this. Let's, let's sit down together and unpack this. Or if we kick an idea or a question to them and encourage them to come up with some solutions together, teaming up, thinking about it, uh, di diagnosing or dialoguing through uh, some solutions, uh, I think we'll see, well, I know we'll see increased engagement when we can provide that space, create a little bit of margin for time to connect. So moving on, my question is this. How epic are you? How epic are you? So it, I, I want to give you just a few simple ideas when we think about leading this generation, some shifts that we can make, and I want to get into some more uh, practical solutions and unpack a few more ideas in a moment. But some shifts that we can make briefly. Number one, don't think control, think connect. Right. Even as the expert, we've got we've got things we're trying to do, information we're trying to pass on, expectations we have of our students. We want them to begin to implement or execute. But rather than think control, what if we think connect? Let's talk about this. Give me your thoughts on this. Let me hear your heart. Create an environment where they can feel safe to to contribute and you'll see more connection with them. Don't think control. Think connect. Don't don't think tell. Think ask. Right? Rather than downloading this information, this is a generation that's very used to uploading their ideas, their content, their own videos, they're making, producing their own TikToks and whatnot. Don't think tell, think ask. And you'll get, uh, I believe you'll get to see some increased engagement. Don't think entertain. I'm not talking about, especially when I talk about um, epic and experiential and participatory. Don't think entertain. This is not about entertaining them and having to do bells and whistles and other things. Think equip. Think about equipping. How can I really put some tools in their tool belt just like we're doing here together today? Don't think impose. Think expose. Imposing, obviously, that's that's downloading uh, that, that sense of I've got information I'm trying to get to you. But think expose. Let's look at the end of this road. If we go down this, if we make this decision, let's look at some people who are implementing uh, this behavior, whatever that may be, and expose them to some information, some fresh ideas, right? And, and I think you'll you'll see if we're connecting and asking questions and going at it from a perspective of equipping, and then we're exposing, uh, then we actually will see some increased engagement. And then lastly, don't think lecture, think lab. Don't think lecture, think lab. And what happens in a lab? I know what hap one thing that happens, there's experimenting. We're trying new things. It doesn't have to be perfect every time. Another thing that happens in a lab setting is we fail. We try and it doesn't work and we try again. And so rather than just having to get it tight and I got my PowerPoint, my bullets and all of that, and I'm lecturing in a lab, we're contributing, right? You'll see students with the goggles on and they're fumbling through. They're trying to get the Bunsen burner working, right? In a lab, they're experimenting. They're hands-on. They're feeling it. They're sensing it. In a lab, they're also trying and sometimes failing. And if we create an environment where they can try and fail, um, actually we'll provide an opportunity for them to grow and to flourish. You think of Formula 409. Where did that come from, right? There was 408 failed attempts and then it was the 409th formula that actually worked. And so in a lab setting, that's what's going on. Think about a lab, not a lecture. So part of how this came about, I mentioned Dr. Elmore sharing, sharing uh, with his family, his kids around the table, 
But when you look at the research, what enables students to remember is probably some of the same things that helped you retain information, not just cramming uh, words and content down into my brain, but what enables students to retain, remember, uh, and implement content most effectively. Three things real quick. Number one, music. Just think schoolhouse rock. I should have nothing else I need to say other than that, right? I'm just a bill. That's number one. Number two is experiences. Experience is a great teacher. If we can provide some experiences, that is actually going to, to cement whatever that is in my psyche. And then thirdly is images, right? We have discovered the power or rediscovered, if you will, the power of a picture, right? Pictures are powerful. I want to tell you this real quickly. They stick, right? Pictures stick. Most people describe themselves as visual learners. They engage emotions and they accelerate application, right? This is research-based when I talk to you about using and leveraging the power of a picture. The, the other thing about pictures is that they, they enable us to tell stories using our imagination. And they, they uh, enel enable us to store lots of information and they're the oldest yet preferred method of communication for today. And so I just wanted to remind you that when we talk about leveraging the power of a picture to communicate that this generation is image rich, it's not just because, oh, hey, they, they have Snapchat, but it's actually based in science that if we can communicate using an image, right, then it, it actually will help our engagement, our retention, and even our execution. So, um, Quick shout out here, so to my athletic trainers in the world, Jason Biles, and I wanna tell you this story before we unpack Habitudes here in a moment. Jason Biles, he's the director of player performance, the head athletic trainer for the Houston Rockets. And uh, he came across some of this material um, a few years back when James Harden had come to the Houston Rockets from Oklahoma City, he was in more of a production role. He was the sixth man of the year. And, uh, and the Rockets organization challenged James to be to be more of a leader, right? They said, James, we need you to, to act more of a, more like a leader and less like a, just a producer. And this is what James Harden said in a Time Magazine article. He said, transitioning from a production role in which you are responsible only for your work into a leadership position can be difficult in any career. And he went on to describe his his one-on-one -on -one sessions with their head athletic trainer, where, where Jason Biles was unpacking some of these images, just like I showed you the water bottle and said that represents uh, the fact that great communicators use what's timely to communicate what's timeless, right? That's an image to help communicate a principle. So he was talking about these one-on-one -on -one sessions with Jason Biles, where Jason would pull up one of these images and be begin to talk about how can we implement this into our lives? If it's uh, identifying my personal core values or how can I be more, as I said, a thermostat versus a thermometer where I just go off of what everyone else does? How can I take some time to think about the relationships in my life? How can I be in more intentional to invite accountability? All of these things are conversations that they might have had in those one-on-one -on -one sessions. And so that's Jason in the bottom right corner. Quick shout out to him and uh, appreciate his is uh, modeling a life of intentional leadership. And so um, what is Habitudes again? It is images that form leadership habits and attitudes. And I thought it would be helpful to just give you a couple. Um, number one, uh, think about the story of the Titanic, right? That, that tragedy that happened in April 1912. Of course, uh, we know that it was described as the unsinkable ship. And as that ship got on its journey, um, they had received over five different messages that there was icebergs in the area. But because the captain was on a, on a schedule, he wanted to set the record for the fastest trip across the Atlantic and there was other missteps along the way, we know tragedy struck. And they hit an iceberg. And uh, if you saw James Cameron's film, The Titanic, I mean, they just did a phenomenal job of unpacking that scene where the two guys in the crow's nest saw that there was an iceberg in the area, and then finally there was engagement and activity. Well, that just represents 
our leadership. And I want to talk to you uh, quickly about this. The iceberg is a great picture of leadership. And to me, it's the, the first principle of character that we could ever talk about because every other conversation about character really can flow straight out of this one. And what I mean is this, the iceberg represents your leadership. In that 10% that's above the water, that represents your skill. The 90% below the water, that's your character. And it's what's below the surface, as in the case of the Titanic, that sinks the ship. And I'm sure uh, if we had time and we could talk about, we could talk about, uh, you know, uh, stories, athletes, leaders that we know of that that kind of had a Titanic experience where it looked great on the outside, but it was things below the surface that ultimately sabotaged that leader. Uh, we could think of people, right, like the Lance Armstrongs of the world and others. So don't want to take too much time on that, but I wanted to show you, again, another example of how we use images to teach leadership and communicate some ideas to young people. Um, another one quickly is, is this. It's a, there's a story that inspired this habitude and the story is of three bricklayers where uh, an individual was leaving the office one day in the big city and came across a huge construction project and not knowing what was going on because he had taken a different route home to work, he found this construction site and, and was fascinated and asked one person working, what is this you're doing? Well, that bricklayer didn't even look up at him. He was just kind of huffed out an answer and then said, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm laying bricks, I'm a bricklayer. Well, that wasn't the answer that that individual was looking for. So he asked another, that one at least looked him in the eye and said, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm getting a paycheck, I'm a bricklayer, it's my job. Also not the answer he was looking for. And so he asked a third bricklayer and that bricklayer said this, he looked at him with a beam in his eye and he said, you don't know what I'm doing. I'm building a cathedral. And when I'm done with this cathedral, it's going to have a huge impact on the city. People are going to come from all over. They're going to pray here, worship here, gather here. They're going to serve the homeless out of here. Weddings are going to happen. Babies will be baptized. All of these things. That bricklayer doing the same job as the other two was very dialed in to the impact of his day-to-day -day work. And that is a great picture for what you and I are doing today. I believe that great leaders uh, see the big picture. Most see only the paycheck or they just see the task in front of them. Oftentimes you're with a student athlete and they're just looking at the, the, the task. What's the brick that I'm laying? Well, maybe it's just doing a few sets of a particular exercise, or maybe the brick for that athlete is they've got to make some changes in their, their diet and their nutrition. Maybe that brick for them is, is they've got to get up and be responsible to be at treatment. But, but you know, just as well as I do, that great leaders see the big picture and they realize they're building a cathedral. And true leaders, they maintain a perspective beyond their own limited vision. And in doing so, they change the culture. Oftentimes we see those students that are really just looking at the, the brick. What's the job that I'm doing or the task? And, and you know, man, if, if they don't make a shift, uh, we could lose this one. They, their engagement could so tail off that I don't know that they're going to not only stick with the program, they might not even be back next year. And so how can we help elevate the perspective of the why behind the what? That's what this is all about. And when I think about this habitude, I'm reminded of a great story. Uh, of course, you know that, that uh, President Kennedy in 1961 got up in front of the country, cast this incredible vision that he wanted to be the, we wanted to be the first country to send a man to the moon and back. And that galvanized the nation. At that time, there wasn't the resources, there wasn't the technology. You and I have more technology in our smartphones, more computing power in our phones than they had in NASA at the time, but they did it. That's the story you know that in 1969, right, uh, Neil Armstrong and the crew, uh, they landed on the moon. One small step for man, one giant step for mankind. But the story you may not know is that a, almost a year later, President Kennedy and his entourage went visiting NASA to check on the progress of this grand vision. And while they were walking the grounds, they took a turn, went down a hallway, came to a door, and thinking they were going into another part of the building, opened the door, and President Kennedy walked straight into the janitor's closet. 
The custodian was in there and he kind of got caught by surprise. Well, the president introduced himself. And of course, he said, I'm President Kennedy. And he asked that janitor, what is it you do here? And the janitor, without batting an eye, without even skipping a step, he looked at the president of the United States, the janitor whose job it was to mop floors, re replace the toilet paper and whatever else it was, looked at him and said this, what am I doing? Mr. President, I'm putting a man on the moon. The janitor understood the impact of his day-to-day -day work on the bigger picture and that it was consequential and potentially lives were at stake if he didn't do his job with energy, enthusiasm, attention to detail, all of those things. And so I wonder sometimes if we are aware of the impact of our day-to-day -day work on others, right? And in your profession, you see student athletes every day. You see athletes, you're working with them. And I wanna remind you that it's not so much about whether or not uh, it's, it's you're doing work, right? As Amy Wisniewski, who's a research professor at Yale, um, Angela Duckworth wrote about this in Grit, a phenomenal book. If you haven't seen it, get it. And what she said in it, this quote is just sums up what I wanna say here. She said, what matters is whether the person doing the work believes that laying down the next brick is just something that has to be done, it's the job or the task, or instead something that will lead to further personal success, like what's in it for me? Am I gonna get a promotion? Am I gonna get a paycheck? Or finally, work that connects the individual to something far greater than the self. I wanna encourage you, you are building a cathedral. You're not just doing day-to-day -day tasks and, and doing work. I believe you're building a cathedral. And if we can help our students be reminded uh, that they too have consequential work, that everything that they're doing is connected to something larger, then I promise you it will help their engagement and it'll help you connect with them a little bit more effectively. I've talked about a lot of things and having said that, I wanna just give you one last thought that to me, John Wooden uh, is, is the quintessential leader when it comes to cathedral building. He knew uh, in his time at UCLA that he was building a cathedral. If you were to ask him at that point, he was asked directly, coach, after all of this success and these national championships, do you feel like you have been successful? And, and he said, I'm not sure, ask me in 10 years. Because Coach Wooden understood that he wasn't just coaching basketball teams, he was building young men. So much so that at his eulogy, Bill Walton stood up and, and told everyone about his relationship with Coach. And he said, Coach never told us much about, we never talked much about basketball or plays. We didn't study the opponent as much. We talked about people and character. And he said, he, he never failed to remind us that in everything that we're doing, we ought to strive to be the best people that we can be. And if we succeed in becoming good people, we'll give ourselves the opportunity to be a good basketball player. And if we do that well, then we have the opportunity to be a pretty good basketball team. And to me, that's just someone who, who was living this out ahead of his time, if you will. And now research is backing that up to say, if we can remind ourselves of the big picture, you know what we are? We're happier, we're more engaged in our work, we're more ready and willing to show up early and stay late and provide the kind of attention to detail, enthusiasm and engagement with our everyday work. And we can help our students do the same thing if we can remind them that they're building a cathedral. That's a lot. Uh, in a, in a short amount of time. I wanna just share this with you. Um, our latest book, Generation Z Unfiltered, is available at generationzunfiltered.com or growingleaders.com. Uh, for you out there, this isn't just for coaches, this is for anyone. You can sign up for Dr. Elmore's weekly blog, free resource that comes to your email. And you also get, uh, if you wanna just text coaches to the number that you see there on the screen, and then what you'll do is you'll get a uh, free resource coming to you. Uh, just some of these principles and others about how we can grow in our leadership and connecting with the next generation of student. As we wrap up, uh, I wanna give you my personal contact. If you wanna reach out to me directly, there's that. And I also want to, uh, want to take a moment and thank 
Gatorade, uh, Gatorade Performance Partner for sponsoring this webinar, sponsoring this time and remind you that there's additional resources available provided by a Gatorade Performance Partner and the GSSI. Things like CEU webinars and other handouts, sports science exchange articles, all of that is available to you through the GSSI. Again, I'm Sterling Brown. This has been helping the next generation win, understanding and connecting with the most anxious generation. Having said that, I want to encourage you to stay safe, to stay healthy, and to stay home. Wish you the best and be well. Bye-bye.